Okay, welcome to the Algebra 1 Semester 2 Review Guide, review, or video review if you will, um, for Mr. Hallam's Algebra 1 class. This will work for any Algebra 1 class in our, I don't know, in our school. So if you're watching, great. If not, you're with me and you're watching. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip through this and either give you some tips and or do the problems for you to kind of get started. Um, there's no way that I can do all of them, um, and if I do them all all the way out, then I won't get much time to talk. So let's go ahead and get started so we kind of keep this sh as short as possible. So flipping down here, um, one of the first ones that I definitely want to kind of talk about is recursive and explicit because we haven't done that in a while. This was the beginning of the semester. Um, remember, recursive is based uh, a sequence, so some numbers in order, right? Um, they go down a list. Sometimes it's horizontal. Um, this one happens to be vertical. But recursive means that you have to look back um, at the previous value to be able to go forward. And that's what this a to the n minus 1 means. It means whatever value you're trying to find, let me actually change that y there. It really should be whatever value, a to the n, that's the value you'd be looking for. You have to look at the previous value and add the difference. So you can see that here's the base form of it. For this particular function, you can see I went and had found the difference. It happened to be linear. Um, that's coincidental, does not have to be. Um, so my difference is 125. And then to figure out what value I want, or whatever value of n I want. So if I wanted 3, I'd have to look back at 2, take $6, add $1.25. If I wanted to find 5, I'd have to see 4. Remember, recursive is limited. You can only go as far as the last term that you have. So if you have 99 terms, you can find the 100th. But if you wanted to find the 200th term, you'd have to go out to 199. That's a lot of work to add all those 125s in that scenario. But the explicit means that you can kind of jump anywhere you want. Um, this is really, um, and let me finish that thought, anywhere. Um, that's really what we work with mostly in algebra, right? We do most of our time in explicit, but this is kind of a recursive section so you can see it. Um, but that kind of there's a relationship there, obviously. Um, but we spend a lot of time here. But it's nice to talk about the recursive a little bit. So scrolling down a little bit farther, here's one about a factoring. I just want to make sure that we quickly talk about factoring. First thing you should always do is GCF your your term. You can see that there's an X in all of those. After that, you can factor. There's three methods that you can factor by, which is a simple form. I just like to say you can kind of see it and factor it. Right? There's no A value no a value larger than one or a value is equal to one um, if you will in that so and then if it's x or grouping that's where a is not equal to one that means that you have a value out there in front and by the a value i mean whatever is your in your leading coefficient um, in this case this one has one so the simple form would be good enough um, and then a special case would be ones that are in these perfectly special setups where you can go ahead and factor and you can see number six is that way and we'll talk about that in a second so this one we gcf that x out i divided x all the way out put it up front and then i factor just what's inside these parentheses here so you can see that blue line i'm drawing in there we just factored x squared plus 7x minus 18. Um, i did make an x so you can kind of see my work there what two values of negative 18 um, add to positive 7, and that's 9 and negative 2. So there's your factored form for that one. Um, I guess it should have a y equals on it. This one would be considered a special case. Um, if we didn't have it as a special case, or if you couldn't remember what the special case is, you'd want to definitely do this. Um, you'd want to put a 0x in there because it can be confusing if you don't have it because you could say, like, how do I factor? There's no GCF. I'm not really sure what to do. with. Actually, there is a GCF, but we don't need it if we consider the special case. And in this one... The special case is difference of squares. Difference of squares says that if this first term is a perfect squared first term, and it is, it's 8x, and the last term is a perfect squared f term, which is 2 for the perfect square, um, and there happens to be a negative in the middle, then you get to do this. You take those perfect squares, you write a positive between them, and you write a negative between them, and you're factored. That's the special case part. Could you go through the X in grouping? Sure, you could, but it's a lot more work. Why not just memorize that? Because it's pretty easy. Okay, so flipping down through, here's one about a box. You usually see something about some type of a rectangular shape. This one happens to be saying that if we extend each of the dimensions, which we already have, five for one dimension, seven for the other, if we extend them by X feet, what's the new dimensions of the box? Or I'm sorry, the new area. I keep saying dimensions. What's the new area of the box? Well, area is equal to length times width, or one side times the other side, right? 
Um, and in this case, if we add x to both of those, so instead of being 5, it's 5 plus x, or instead of being 7 for this one, it's 7 plus x, we'd multiply those because that's a length and that's a width. We can even add that on there, length, width. It doesn't matter which one's which. Um, and then you, of course, would multiply it out if you foiled or distributed. I prefer distributed, right? If you distributed, you'd probably get that if you didn't rearrange it. But then I went ahead and rearranged it and put it in standard form. You'd always want to make sure that you get it in standard form, especially on a multiple choice test. They're going to rearrange those most often for you. All right, scrolling down a little bit more. Um, here's one about a graphed function. Um, in vertex form, it wants you to write the equation. Remember, vertex form for these, and notice all these notes that I have, and you're like, how do I write all these notes for my 5% extra credit? This is how. These are the things that you'd want to write down. These are just the minimum, by the way. There's a lot more you can add in there, so feel free to go crazy on those notes. But this one, you should know. It won't be given to you, but I'm sure at this point you've had it pounded into your heads pretty well, right? Vertex form for a quadratic is y equals ax squared, or ax x minus h squared plus k. Um, and in this one, what you do is identify your vertex, which is right there. Notice I've drawn it out for you, which is 1 and 8. You plug it in. Remember that this part right here is supposed to be negative. So whatever it looks like, if it's positive, it should look opposite inside of with the x there, right? So and then we plug in the 8. It should not look opposite because it has a positive here. So there we go. The only thing that we have to find is A, and that's a little tricky. It's kind of on the top end of what we're going to do. I'm going to say that for our test, you probably won't have to do that. But here's the little piece if you happen to forget about it. It's at the top end of the stuff that we did. I went ahead and made a chart of these points. You can see these points here. I just I put them into a table for us. Um, the reason that we did that is you can find the A value by the first change from the vertex. If you remember that, great. You probably don't need to, but it's a nice little note. So my first change, this is my vertex, right? 1, 8. Here it is. Here it is. My change, my first change from the vertex is a negative 2. And notice it's the same on both because there's symmetry, right? Um, that is fine. You can take either side. It doesn't matter. They're both the same. So it's a negative 2. There should be a negative there. So you take that negative 2 and you plug that into that already working formula that we started and then that would be your equation vertex form chances are it's going to be one on the test or they're going to give it to you in a different way they'll actually just provide it it'll be in standard form they'll say oh you can steal remember if it's in standard form y equals ax squared plus bx and they say write this in vertex form remember you can steal the a value you don't have to calculate it which is kind of nice it's about the only time in your life you should steal so Scrolling down a little bit more, um, here's one about completing the square. Wanted to make sure that I reviewed that a little bit. Notice it says solve, which means that we also have another step on there. It's not just complete the square. For, so for completing the square, if you, especially if you're solving, you want to find a new C value. Um, this is how you find a new C value, because that's what completing the square is, right? You're making a brand new C value that makes this factorable. Because originally then, this particular quadratic is not factorable. You can't factor that. There are no two values of negative 7 that combine to make negative 8. It just isn't possible. So what we do is we make a new C value. How do we do that? B divided by 2 squared. So you take that middle term, that B, and you divide it by 2, and you square it, and you get 16. At that point, you want to add it to both sides of the equation, because whatever we do to one side of the equation, we have to do to the other. So we're going to add it to both sides of the equation. From there, if you combine it, you'll get 9 times, or is equal to the quantity of x minus 4 squared. And then it says solve. So we would go ahead and attempt to solve this one. So we'd square root both sides. Remember, when you're solving and you take a square root, you absolutely have to add a plus or minus. If the square root's already there um, in the function, in the formula, you do not have to add the plus or minus. It's only when you take the square root of something and you're solving. Okay, so we add a plus or minus, so we get x, and again, moving that 4 over, we get x is equal to 4 plus or minus square root of 3. If we simplify that, 4 plus 3 is 7, and 4 minus 3 is 1. So there's your solution. All right, scrolling down a little bit more, 14 here, which is a solution for the system of equations. Um, this one I wanted to do because if you're given something about a system, remember this means just more than one function. And what you want to do is it depends how many they give you. Um, but you want to graph them is probably the easiest way. I didn't do that with this one, and I'll show you. Um, if you want to graph it, I can 
I can kind of cheat this out a little bit. We can sketch it so the quadratic would look something like this because it's positive and it's through the origin. And the line, we'll make it red, um, is like positive 15 and it's down to negative 2. So it's going to have a kind of steep slope. What you're looking for, see if I can do this in black, is the intersection visually. And most of us can graph pretty well, so that's probably one of the easier ways to go about it. But if you don't and you decide to do it by hand, which is the more mathematician way, um, what you want to do is, if it's a system and they're solved, this is really just substitution here. It's nice when they're both y equals, right? Because then you're just going to set them equal to each other. Or the substituting part would say, okay, y is equal to x squared. So I take this x squared and I plug it in. Oops, didn't change my color. Um, let me see if I can get that to go back. Where's my blue? There's blue. Take x squared and plug it in for y in the other equation where you see it. And what you get is something looks like this. Then you would solve that. Um, in this case, it ends up being a quadratic. I can solve by factoring. So there's, you can see me factoring it. It's a simple form, but I did the x so you can see it. And it comes up to be the x is negative 5 and 3, which means that it crosses twice. So there's another crossing over here is what that's saying visually. So there's two solutions that you'd have to find. Okay, 15, a little tip for you. Notice this one here. I'd probably graph this one. I got a quadratic. I got another linear. It looks a little bit bigger. This one didn't look too tough. It was, it was pretty simple. It was a monomial and a binomial, so I felt like I could do it by hand pretty quickly. This one, I'd throw that in my calculator to find that. And find the intersections. There may be more than one, especially if there's a quadratic involved, right? It's going to be U-shaped, so there's a chance to cross it twice, and this is a linear function. So definitely graph it. Look for where those intersect. All right, moving along, um, says complete the table for the equation. It, this one, for some reason, I feel like some of you will miss. I still want to make sure that we've got this hammered home. What this is saying is that take these x values, plug them in, right? So I'm going to change this to function notation just because I don't want to trick you. Nah, because function notation is good for plugging stuff in. And plug those values in. Right? I'm going to plug in negative 2 here for that x right there. And then I'm going to put minus negative 2 right, for that x right there. And then minus 7. And I'm going to find out what that's equal to. And then I'm going to put it in the table. It won't look like that on the multiple choice test, but you get the idea. This is just saying complete the table. It says plug in these x values. Okay? Or plug in for x right there. I already pre-wrote it. Make sure that that's so simple that you don't mess those up. But it's nice to talk about. Um, by looking at the graph, where do the functions intersect? It's kind of like a systems question. We did it before. Yeah, just go ahead and graph those. Find the intersection point. All right, 18. What are the zeros of this function? This is really just checking to see that you know what a zero is. And a zero is where you cross, the function crosses, the x-axis. Right, that's the x-axis. You just have to identify those. So if we looked at this, it's negative 1, it's negative 2. So one of them is at negative 2. And the other one is at 4. There's your intersections. Okay, Keeping it simple, moving right along. All right, so this one here is about a uh, parabola. It shows height versus time right, of a rocket. Now, this is not the path of the rocket. This is how high the rocket is over time. So if we look at this, it says... Describe the domain for this situation. Remember, domain is how far left and right you can find that function. Okay, so if I'm looking at this function, I don't care how tall it is. I don't care how far down it went. I care how far to the left I can find it and how far to the right I can find it. And since this is a real-life situation, because a student's launching a rocket, then I need to live in reality. As soon as you know it's real life, you're probably in quadrant one, which... We are zero, zero positive values. So what we need to do is find the lowest point that it exists in that area, right? Because this function, don't forget, is going to go forever this way and this way. And that means that it can go on down to the negative values that we don't care about. So we're going to curtail it. We're going to stop it at the two points in our quadrant one that makes sense to work with. So that point there happens to be zero. This is the lowest point that you have. And your highest point here is eight. Remember, you can start all of these domain and range questions as a compound inequality, just like that. And then you put your low bound here, and you put your high bound here, your upper boundary here, right? And you just write them in. And if it's touching that point, which this one is at zero, you put the equal sign underneath, and it's touching eight, so you put the equal sign underneath. If it's infinity, you wouldn't, because you can't touch infinity. So that's where this comes from. Okay.
Moving right along. Chugga, chugga, chugga. All right, so we got Kara here. She has translated this graph here, or she has this graph. She wants to know what the translation was. Really, it's just saying, hey, do you know how the vertex form moves? Yeah, inside the parentheses, right, this h value is the h coordinate. And since it has a negative there, if the value is positive inside, it means that we went to the left. And if it's negative, we went to the right. K is the reverse, right? It's the way that we expect it to be. Positive goes up and negative goes down. So this is a positive one. So that means that it's going to go to the left, one. And this is a negative three. And that means it's going to go down three. Pretty simple. As long as you remember this, notice there's a little note there. Add that in in your pack app. It's going to be helpful for your 5%. Find the sum of these two um, complex numbers. Um, so well, let's first change these into complex numbers. So remember that the negative there turns into i. That's the point of this, right? So it turns into i. So we end up with, in this case, um, i times the square root of 9. And the square root of 9 is 3. So 3 times i, or 3i, that's where this comes from. And that's where this comes from, right? 121, the square root of that is 11. We combine our real numbers, put them out front. They should always go out front, right? Real numbers in front and imaginary numbers in back. That makes your complex number form. Okay, so put that out front, combine your, uh, your, your imaginary numbers, and you end up with 14i, so you're all set. All right, moving down a little bit more, 27. Um, it doesn't matter that this is a cubic crazy looking function, something we didn't deal with. doesn't matter because all it's asking us about is domain. So for domain, we just need to find out what the values happen to be. Um, oh, I'm sorry. And it gives us the domain. It wants to know the range. So again, this can be a tricky question. It's super easy to do, but sometimes students don't know what it's asking. Well, if these are domains then the appropriate range comes from them being plugged into the equation. So you take negative 2, and wherever you see an x, you plug it in for it, and you solve it. So f of negative 2 comes out to be some value. I'll let you do that calculation. It's pretty simple, right? 10 minus negative 2 cubed divided by 3. I'm sure you can put it in your calculator. If not, do it in your head. Um, and then that's your value. That's the first set of the range. So your range then will be some y values. You use your fancy brackets to show a set of numbers. And it'll be the exact set of numbers here, whatever comes out, right? They'll be plugged those in. Whatever comes out will go in the range. So you have five values there. So we should have five values come out here. That would be the appropriate range. Okay? This would be a discrete range, by the way meaning that it has a set of number of finite, I don't know if I can spell that word, finite number set, right? If it's a continuous number set, we use our, our inequality, our compound inequality to do that. All right, scrolling along. It says write the equation of the graph at the right in factored form. So first thing I like to do is look at the end behavior. I know it's odd and positive, so I'm looking for an odd positive um, factored form. It's not it's necessary for writing the function, but it's something to note so that you can see that when you're done writing it from the linear factors here, that you did it right. It should match, right? So then next part, then the linear factors, let's identify them. I went ahead and changed them. This is really x equals negative 3. That's the intercept, right? x equals 0. I didn't change that one, and this one is x equals positive 4. But to get to the linear factors, we have to unsolve them. Unsolved mysteries, a show you probably have never seen. Huge in the 90s. Unsolve them. Um, and so that means subtract 4 to the other side. So we find out that x minus 4 equals 0 and x plus 3 equals 0. And those are your linear factors. Well, x equals 0, that just means you put the x. That should always go out front for the standard form of factored form. Um, and this one, always assume, um, unless otherwise given, a is equal to 1. You don't have to track that down or calculate it for those particular ones. If it's a quadratic, though, that's a different story. You might have to calculate it. 32, there's a quadratic formula because it says use the quadratic formula. But let's be realistic here. I am on a multiple choice test where my teachers are not looking at how I do this. And it's probably bad that I tell you this, but I'm just going to tell you to be the smartest that you can possibly be, which means that I would graph this. Um, and I would find the intersections wherever it happened to be, right? So it's some quadratic it's positive and going up so it's going to do something like this i would graph it and just find these intersections right here 
Yeah, that would be much easier, probably less mistakes there. Plug it into the Y equals menu, second calculate, left bound, right bound. All right, still cruising. Here's a big one for us. I'll slim it down a little bit so we can see most of it. It's got uh, Miss Benson. She's got some geometry classes. She's got some scores, 120 of them. That's a whole bunch, Mr. Hallam. Yeah, I didn't type all those in. Um, I kind of did, but I used the frequency. So just so that you know, I did L1 for this one, right? And then I did L2 here. And then when I got to my calculation part under my one variable stats, um, I put where it says frequency list, I typed in L2 there. So that way I didn't have to type in 25 six times and 24 nine times and 23 seven times. I, I did that. It's much more efficient. And so you can see here's the one variable stats that came out of there. Um, and then here's the box plot that I did right after. So let's see if we can answer the questions now that we've got that stuff sorted out. It says Miss Benson here. Um, concluded that the middle half of the scores are between 18 and 22. So middle half is kind of similar to the IQR, right? It's the lower quartile or quartile 1 to quartile 3. That would be the middle half. That's what that means, right? It's in the middle and it's 50% of the data. Don't forget that these are quartiles, meaning 25%. So if I have two of them, right, quartile 1 to quartile 3 is two of them, that's 50%, or the middle half of the data. And it is between 18 and 22. If you hit trace, you can scroll over and see that but that's what it gives me um, you could do that by hand pretty easily well with all these values maybe not but you could so there's your 50 percent so I said yes this is valid um, you can see that in the box plot above then she starts to adjust the information she said that uh, there was a new calculation because there was two correct answers so some of the students are going to get a point back if they answered it um, on the wrong way so here's what she concluded that the mean test score would increase that is true valid the mean x bar right increases as scores increases so some scores are going to change and they're going to change for the higher so the mean has to go up right but here's where it gets a little tricky the median right she said it's going to increase well that's not true but that's why, why we can say that is we don't know which values changed. So the median's the middle of the numbers. So if I have all these dots out here and the median's this middle number, I don't know if a value changed over here so it's higher so that median moved or if this one just flip-flopped on one side and this one flip-flopped on one side. So you don't know where they're at. So it's not necessarily true that the median also increased. It would be dependent on which value has changed. They didn't tell us, so we'll say no. We can't tell you. That's not a true statement right now. Um, and the range would be very similar. The thing with the range is the range could increase, but the only way it would increase is if the last value happened to go up, then the whole range would sneak up a little bit, right? Because the maximum number of test scores is 25, so that can't go up anyway. So it's just that last value. So unless they tell us that that last value increases, the range did not increase either. All right, moving along. I see we're closing in in 25 minutes, which means I need to finish up. This question's kind of nice. It talks about the mean and the weight. So she said if she took this zero out, what would happen? Um, the only thing that's going to affect this one is the mean because the mean's affected by that outlier right there, that weight. It's so far away. Here's our 90s, right? And here's this zero all the way over here. It's so heavy because it's so far away. It's going to drag that. Uh, here's our median, right? It's going to drag our average all the way over here somewhere, right? That'll be our average. It'll drag it over because it's so far away. So if you take that zero out, then the only thing that really should be affected is that mean. Um, all right, uh, next one, this is kind of similar. Drop this average, retake that average there. Um, it's very similar to the one that was done up above, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. This one was one of the most missed questions on our review. Um, hopefully we sorted that out. Um, what this is giving you a scatter plot, it gives you a line, um, a trend line, a line of regression, will you? And it says it stops right here. Right? And then it says, hey, according to the data, what happens on June 30th? Well, our model doesn't go there. But that's why we make this model. We just project it out, right? If we had a calculator, we'd do it exact, but it doesn't ask that. It just says make a prediction. So we're going to go ahead and project it out. So just grab a straight edge or carefully line that out so that you can see that 54 would be the temperature on June 30th if this trend keeps going. And why wouldn't it? It gets warmer a little later in June, right? So estimate. 
This one's asking a little bit about the correlation, but it's asking you to estimate again. What's the best description um, of the correlation between these two quantities? So if we were to give a description here, um, one, we say that there is a trend. These, these points here kind of are going in this fashion, all of them in some way or another. It's probably going to be moderate to medium um, of correlation, meaning it's probably somewhere from like a 0.7 to maybe a 0.6, maybe a 0.5. Um, and these are positive values, of course, because it's trending up from right to left, right? So that means, or from left to right, I did that exactly backwards, that's really funny, from left to right. So it's going up, right? It's going up on this side. So that means it's a positive value. So you can also say that as part of the description. So you say it's pr there is a, there's a pattern, it's, it's pretty good, um, it's not perfect, it's not really strong, it's medium to maybe it's strong, but not very strong by any means. Um, this one here asks us to write the equation for the line of best fit, which is just another way. We didn't say line of best fit a lot this year, but it just means the regression line. Um, the regression lines that we did in our calculator. We didn't do a lot by hand this year, so we did a lot by calculator. So that just means, hey, write the, the regression line there. So you just find, find slope, extrapolate this out, find your y-intercept, right? Find the slope, find two good points to find the slope from, how many up and over. So it's up two over two, so slope is one, it looks like. And then write the equation in uh, a linear form. Kind of did that for you. Um, but that's what that's asking you to do. I think that's the last one there. All right, so 25 minutes, we're good on time. Um, I did some of those, I didn't do all of them. If there's some that you didn't see that you wanna see, make sure that you uh, ask me in class. All right, we'll see you in there for some good review days, or one good review day and a lot of good questions. All right, see you later.